This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list at coldwarconversations.com. You're listening to part two of my chat with Joe Andrew, who joined the US Air Force in 1981 and was trained to fly the A-10 Warthog. Part one is episode 305. In 1985, Joe is sent to the 92nd Tactical Fighter Squadron at RAF Bentwaters in the UK, just over 50 miles from where his father served in World War II. His role is to fly the A-10 over West Germany and attack Warsaw Pact ground forces should the Cold War turn hot. We hear about the perils of flying the A-10 at only 100 feet in mist and rain whilst navigating with a map on your knee in the days before GPS was available. Joe also recounts visiting the inner German border and driving to his wartime target sectors to see what they look like from the ground. He describes how he trained for landing on West German autobahns as well as their tactics against enemy aircraft. Joe also flew the Royal Air Force's vertical takeoff and landing fighter the Harrier and tells of the challenge of managing the controls and his respect for the Royal Air Force. I'm delighted to welcome Joe back to our Cold War conversation. We used to make road trips, uh, so we would go to the debt for two weeks We'd leave on a Monday, stay through that weekend, and then come back the following Friday. And on that middle weekend, uh, more than once, we would go up basically almost to the IGB, uh, the inter-German border. And uh, we would eyeball, you know, on the drive, you, you, okay, you'd look at the terrain on the, on, on the way up. And then you go up and eyeball the, uh, the, the tower guards on the other side. Uh, and... You know, we're all in civilian clothes, but we're driving a German Air Force Volkswagen bus. You know, it wasn't really too stealthy. Uh, But they told us just be sure and don't, you know, give them the finger or wave to them or any of that stuff. Just look at them through binoculars and, you know, get the lay of the land, really. But uh, that was pretty interesting. Were any of your sort of kill zones the other side of the, uh, the IGB in the rear areas? That's a that's a hard one because I can't remember if they actually they probably were uh, because at that point you know the game is on so the, the IGB doesn't exist anymore but specifically I can't I can't remember if they were actually on the other side of it or not they may have they may have been um, but our kind of going in concept was that this wasn't going to be a sneak attack you know there was going to be some massing you know along the along the border. Uh, but I, I'm sorry, I, I just can't remember if, if, if our strike targets for the, maybe those first, you know, missions that were pre-planned were actually on on this side or that side. May have well been on the others, just on the other side. No, that's fine. That's fine. I realize I'm asking you ridiculous detail from quite some time ago, so don't worry about that. Um, so with your, your forward operating locations, I've seen the A-10 practice landing on autobahns and, and other sort of uh, temporary strips. Did you ever practice that? Uh, we did. Um, it, it's really funny. If you would go, and I can't remember the exact locations of it, but uh, we would be driving down the autobahn and we would pull into a rest area. Uh, and if you went into the rest area, into the parking area, and you really looked hard, you'd figure out that the yellow lines that were there were for parking A-10s. So they they actually had uh, the spacing for our wingspan where you could park six or eight A-10s in this really big uh, rest area on the German Autobahn. Uh, it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a problem. I mean, you know, uh, the Autobahn was wider than some of the runways we landed on. We, we would go up to uh, some of the Army for, or Army bases that had helicopters, maybe maybe propeller airplanes, maybe a 3,000-foot strip, and, you know, we'd, we'd operate out of there as well uh, because we could. You know, we had that short field capability. Uh, so, yeah, it was uh, – we had options, and we knew that uh, if, if the balloon went up, as we thought it probably would happen, then our bases, where they were, would probably be struck uh, by something – 
I mean, I would think reasonably early. But uh, so we might we might have to be operating off of taxiways, autobahns, you know, army strips. Uh, but we had that flexibility where not many airplanes did. I mean, did the A ten have a a reinforced undercarriage for sort of rougher strips, or or did it need to be something relatively smooth like an auto barn? Uh, no, it's pretty beefy. Uh, we've uh, undertaken landing on we land on dry lake beds. Um, uh, you can land on. You don't want to really, really land on dirt, but I think you could because where the engines are, as long as it's reasonably level. So yeah, it's it's a very it's a pretty strong undercarriage. Uh, I don't know. You know, other than Audubon, uh, dry lake beds, other strips like that, I can't remember if they've tested it out on really, really austere landing strips. I mean, I mean, think of it this way: if you can land a Harrier as I did on a on a grass infield of between runways, then I'm sure you could land an A10 on it. You know, uh, because it's it's a lot sturdier gear than a Harrier. So as far as the 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 low level flying in Europe, you know, you said it it was it was different. How how was it was it different in in terms of you know the, this low level navigation as well? I think the weather was probably the biggest limiting factor. Uh, in certain parts of Germany, we could go down to two hundred and fifty feet uh, in the low fly areas. Otherwise, we're at five hundred feet. In in southern Germany, there was like, quite a lot of vertical development. And so you might be able to go from, you know, this ridge line to this castle because it's sitting on top of a hill to something over here. Uh, when we transitioned up to Allhorn in northern Germany, uh, there's a reason they call it the North German Plain. It is just flat. So your uh, your turn points uh, may be a little bit more difficult to pick out, especially in marginal weather. Uh, now, we did have an inertial nav system, and it would get you close uh, but it might not get you exactly there unless you were constantly updating it. So we had to uh, really kind of uh, north North Germany was probably a little tougher than South Germany just for terrain. Weather was always a, a factor. Uh, you know, we you could usually get or you know get there in the end. You just might you know miss a turn point by half a mile or something, but pick it up and and reference because because we did latin instead of black line nav i think we had a better situational awareness of the things that were around that turn point and you go oh, okay well road junction's over here but that was my turn point but okay the town i'm kind of flying over it so i know where i am now um, so you kind of had a better a better essay if you will uh for for yeah. getting from point a to point b yeah because uh again you know what People are so used to satellite navigation nowadays, whereas you're flying on the basis of a map on your lap or memory of where your turn points yeah. are as well. I mean, this is a completely different game, and you're doing this at low level, so you're looking out for pylons and God knows what. Airplanes, yeah, other airplanes. Uh, the, the way they taught you to do that map reading and flying uh, off the map was going clock to map to ground. So uh, you'd hack your clock at every turn point and you would know, okay, at two minutes, I'm looking at my map, I should see this ridge line. Then you'd go outside and try to find it. Uh, if you did it the other way around, you could convince yourself that, okay, that ridge line is this one, but it may not be. Uh, so you always referenced your map because it had, it had tick marks for each minute. Uh, and you had a grease pencil that I think was a four-minute grease pencil on the one to two fifty thousand map, so you could slap that down and go, okay, that's four minutes, and then cut it in half, and that's two minutes. Uh, and you had a kind of a ready reference, and, and then you would uh, you just back yourself up with that. And then you did have the inertial nav, which when the original A10s came to Beltwaters, they didn't have inertial nav, so they were really that's all they had was uh, was map reading. And, and now, of course, they've got GPS and I mean they the thing is always on the thing and you're never lost uh, which is which is the loss of a really a really critical skill I think but nobody's asked me so 
Yeah, yeah. And inertial nav is sort of like this mechanical thing with gimbals and what have you that would sort of give you an indication of where, where you were. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and it was it was very good uh, if you updated it. And you could say you overflew your, your third turn point where you could see, okay, my turn point is at 12 o'clock. My inertial is telling me it's at 1 o'clock. So I'm going to fly over the turn point, and I'm going to update this kit to tell it, no, stupid, you're not over there, you're here. And then it was right back on again. And if you could do that every so often, then you could keep it pretty close, um, and it wouldn't drift quite as bad. But there's drift in every one of those inertial nav kits that, that was around when, when I was doing it. Uh, nothing like that now. Yeah, until somebody jams the GPS, and then you stop. Yeah, well, you know, this, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, now, it, when you when you're in Europe, where are you? You know, practicing your bombing and your your missile firing and the Gatling. So when we went to the FOLs, uh, there was a lot of it that was dry. So in other words, we would work with army units. That are, at that time, they were called ground facts. Now they're they're called joint terminal attack controllers or something. but uh, And we would get tasking through uh, the tasking organization. Like when we were going out of Lipheim, I think we were part of uh, 4A TAF, so, which was the Allied Tactical Air Forces. And so they provided tasking for us to train with the Army. And so we would get tasked uh, to go up and work with, you know, 7th Corps or whatever. Uh, and then we would do runs on on their equipment that they might be in the field doing maneuvers. Uh, and we would try to find them and then engage them dry with Maverick and gun, uh, for our training in theirs so that they got training on being attacked by airplanes. And we got training on, which was really critical on finding tactical sized targets in the German countryside, uh, maybe in bad viz, uh, but that are camouflaged and are not sitting out in the open. Uh, so it was, it was great for us, um, didn't drop anything, but at the end of the day, you learned a lot more than you did sometimes just by going to a bombing range. But, uh, there were, um, controlled bombing ranges, which were, uh, in the North and the South that we used for dropping practice, uh, little, little blue bombs, BDUs, 33s, which put out a smoke charge. Uh, some of them would let us strafe. Uh, some of them would not because our 30 millimeter would just destroy their scoring system uh it wasn't the way they had it protected was not good enough for uh for 30 millimeter and so we could do that and then there were a couple of tactical ranges where we might get a chance to go shoot uh you know at a a tank hulk that's out in the middle of the range in a tactical environment rather than in a in a controlled range environment where you're just circling up and and dropping bombs for score so yeah, you, there was some of that. I think most of it, if I remember correctly, uh, most of it was was uh, dry tasking uh, through the army. And we had a ground liaison stationed at every one of the FOLs that liaised with the army and got us these taskings. And so, uh, and the fun part, besides doing the tasking, was if the weather was good, we would take off. Uh, again, usually Lipheim could be all horn take off low altitude, drop into a low fly area seven, which is down in, in Southern Germany. Uh, you could get in, in LFA seven, you could get out of 250 feet. I'm, I'm pretty sure that, uh, was back then. And every airplane in Europe, it seemed like would always troll through LFA seven, looking to bounce unaware, uh, airplanes. So you wouldn't get through there without getting attacked by a German F-4. Uh, you know, uh, we were attacked one time by, I think the German Navy had F-104s at one point. Uh, and then they'd come attack you or, or, or Dutch F-16s. So it was great from that perspective because then, then you could work on your air-to-air -air lookout uh, and your self-protection. So you got really two parts two different missions on, on one by doing that. You'd work with the Army, and then you'd be able to do some air-to-air -air defensive maneuvering uh, as well. And that, I mean, that's a pretty full day. Uh, 
that was uh, that was a filling taking a lot of boxes as the Brits say yeah so with with your army liaison would they be calling you down on targets like World War II or would you be looking for targets on on your own initiative uh usually with the army um you would get tasked to an initial point an ip uh you would contact the ground controller uh the army guy or maybe an an air force guy who's who's doing that job on the ground because we didn't have a lot of air uh, forward air controllers that were flying airplanes uh and they would they would tell you what they wanted you to hit so they would give you what we called a nine line briefing, which would be the IP, the run in, the distance, the coordinates, uh, restrictions, uh, what kind of ordinance they wanted. Uh, if they wanted you to run within a piece of pie for a run in heading to, to keep you from, you know, maybe hitting friendlies, they'd tell you that. And so you would, you would sit at low altitude having all this information. And, and back then, I don't know if they'll let them do it now, but that, that four minute grease pencil we had, we would write it all on the canopy it's because then your head wasn't down in the cockpit trying to write things on a kneeboard uh, and you were less less prone to run into the ground. And uh, so while I was the flight lead, while I was writing all that on the canopy, my number two man is watching me and watching six o'clock and make sure, making sure we don't get engaged by air threats or ground threats. And then I would plot it and then I would tell him, okay, heads up. You can plot it and tell me what you see. And so we would take long enough, unless it was a troops in contact kind of thing, uh, where we would, I would plot it and I would say, you know, you're on me, let's go kill it. Uh, we talk about it and say, here's what we're going to do. And uh, and then we would go in and try to find those those four APCs in a, in a tree line, for goodness sake, that uh, you'd have a hard time picking out if you were standing still, much less going 300 knots. Uh so yeah, it was uh, that was great training, and and it uh, it was frustrating at times because you not you didn't always see what they were talking about, but uh, you know from our perspective that was kind of what it was going to be like uh, for real. Except ho- well, not hopefully, but probably there was going to be a a bigger array of targets out there that we could that we could see. Because that sounds like quite a lot of information to take in whilst flying at low level, making sure you don't fly into something. It is. Uh, if you had the if you had the luxury and you were far enough back from a threat, you would pop up your altitude maybe to five hundred feet, uh, which we were very comfortable at. And because you're riding heads up, you know you're you're kind of keeping your your uh, situational awareness on where your airplane is going. Uh, but at some point, you're going to have to plot it on a map and do all that. So, yeah, it was fairly labor-intensive uh, to get all that down because if we were lucky, we had a one to 50,000 scale map of the target area. But many cases, it wasn't. It was a it was that same one to 250, and you're trying to plot it on that, which is uh, you know, all you're getting is, is basically general area then because it's uh, it's a little too broad a brush to really pick out a, a target unless it was sitting in a big intersection or something like that did you have many accidents not you yourself but did the the u.s air force have many accidents with the a-10 in europe boy not really uh that i can remember we did have one and i was i was still there uh and it wasn't an employment during an employment it was um it was during a cloud break in Germany. Uh, there was a, a village called Rimscheid, and I think this was 88, maybe 87. But uh, the wingman was trying to rejoin on the flight lead, went lost wingman in weather, became disoriented, and then crashed almost into the town. Um, but as far as, as airplanes hitting the dirt, doing this kind of tasking and stuff, Gosh, I don't. I'm sure there may have been a few, maybe that that happened before I got there. Uh, but during my time, I don't. I don't remember any. Uh, maybe completely wrong. Uh, but uh, I mean, you have to remember. In our defense, uh, we were very experienced at what we were doing. Uh, I, I looked up uh, 
Ian yesterday because I just happened to find the folder. Uh, in, in three years uh, at Meltwaters, I, I got nearly 900 hours. That's almost 300 hours a year, uh, which is just was unheard of uh, in any other fighter community. Uh, so we flew a lot, and and we did. You know, obviously the majority of our work was low altitude, so we were we were pretty darn good at it. Uh, because we didn't have multiple missions, we could focus on those basics. That uh, you know, there's a lot to be said for a single mission airplane. I don't care what the generals say, uh, and that and and we were very good at what we did. I you know, toot our own horn a little bit, but uh, the attrition might have been high in World War III, but we we're going to give it a pretty damn good go. A moment ago, you you were talking about sort of air to air practice. What were your options and and tactics if you were attacked by another aircraft? The first thing was was just to get eyes on. So we would usually fly in a line of breast, one mile apart uh, formation. Uh, obviously, we had radar warning gear. Uh, pad, which is passive, you know, it, but we didn't have any kind of radar. Anything's going to show us. If we were lucky, we might have an AWACS that could give us uh, awareness about where threats might be, but mostly it was just us. Uh, so our visual lookout was critical, uh, and the wingman had certain certain responsibilities uh, to look at. I had certain responsibilities as a flight lead. Uh, but if we ever got engaged, just in a visual fight, I mean, there's there's many iterations where if you think you got a radar missile launched at you, you're going to do something different. But if the bad guy was coming up my six o'clock, uh, then we were going to break into him, and that goes back to that turn rate. You know, we can turn around, you know, pretty damn quick. Uh, when I was at Bentwaters, we had not gotten AIM nines yet, AIM nine heat seeking uh, air to air missiles. So it was purely a gunfight for us. Uh, we did have chaff and flare. In fact, quite a bit of chaff and flare. So if we thought he was launching an IR missile at us, we, we, had, we had flare programs we could put out to try to decoy that in the break. Uh, and the harder you broke, the more dis- dispersion you got with the flares. If you thought it was a radar missile, you could put chaff out. But the whole purpose of the exercise was to get turned around so that now uh, his advantage is negated. And once you got to that point, in in World War Three, he probably wasn't going to stick around and try to kill you because there was going to be other people trying to kill him. Uh, in peacetime, you know, we could wrap it up for ten minutes, and he'd go up, use a vertical, and then come back down. All we're trying to do is get our nose on him. Uh, and we used to have a thing called circle the hogs, where if we saw him quick enough, we would point. So we'd point at each other, we'd cross. And then we, we would end up across a circle, okay? So he's looking at my 6 o'clock, I'm looking at his, and anywhere this guy tries to point down into the fight, he's going to have a nose that can, that can get to him. Uh, and so that was a defensive maneuver that uh, we used for quite a long time. Once we got aim nines, that still was viable, uh, but you might just be able to turn around and shoot at him. Uh, but the whole the whole initial move was okay get him out of my six o'clock decoy with chaff and flare and get him up in my front quadrant uh so that we can either fight with a gun uh which was you know we had a pretty good gun but and it might have scared him but that was going to be a challenge but yeah later on when you went and aim nine mics uh that gave you a little bit more of a of a hope that you could do something with them and the air to air guys that listen to this will just be laughing the whole time i'm saying <laughs> saying all this but that was kind of our that was kind of our mo for uh, air to air. It sort of brings me on to another another question I've got, which is: Were you briefed as to what your likely survivability rate was going to be if the balloon went up? It's I'm funny, smiling. It's funny you mention that. Um, I don't remember the wing leadership or squadron leadership ever coming to us and telling us this. Uh, I read recently where uh, they'd figured out that we were going to lose seven airplanes every 100 sorties. So 7% loss rate uh, ad infinitum. So 
So which meant that we would be out of A-10s in about two weeks uh, with, uh, you know, it, with the war going on as it did. And I, you know, I never saw any assumptions on what that was based. So I kind of just blew it off. But we, uh, we knew that uh, we were going to take losses. I mean, there was no way around it. Uh, but w- that never slowed us down a, a bit. And we never, I never, I don't remember anybody ever mentioning that because uh, that was not in our, that was not in our thought process at all. Uh, we were going to go kill as many as we could kill and, and just hope that that was enough. Because if it got to that point, you know, where we're fighting World War Three, then it's really hit the fan and, you know, it's all hands on deck and uh, uh, not like a, you know, if they had told uh, the generals in Desert Storm, well, you're going to use lose seven airplanes every hundred missions, that might have had some effect. But uh, for, from our perspective, it was just, hey, this is our mission. Uh, we're good at it and we're going to go do it until either the war's over, uh, we're dead, uh, or they tell us to stop. You know, that that was and that was it's funny you bring that up because I've, I've read that a couple of places oh well you know uh, we were going to be cannon fodder and i never thought that the whole time i was there i guess you think this is never going to happen i'm i'm never going to have to do this or you're hoping that you're never going to have to do this for real well yeah obviously nobody wants to engage in world war three um but it's funny you know it, it's like that's what they're paying me for. That's what they've trained me for. Uh, if we get to that point, then that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and it was never up. The camaraderie of the 81st fighter wing, tech fighter wing at that, in that period, and probably before us, uh, they weren't there a lot longer after me. Uh, but there, there was a lot of, uh, positives, as far as the wing leadership, I mean, there was there was not a negative. I never heard a negative thing about what our mission was, uh, what our capabilities were. I mean, it was all, you guys, you're trained for it. You can do it, and we're going to do it. And uh, so it was a very positive wing type of uh, mentality, and uh, as as it has to be. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't have naysayers uh, trying to trying to you know pat you on the head. Did you do any training with regard to escape and evasion if you were brought down? Uh, only uh, prior. Actually, it was post, uh, when did I go? I think I went right after my formal A-10 training in 1983, and it was, uh, I think one of your other uh, podcasters has talked about it. It was in uh, Washington State, and it was split into uh, survival uh, which was living in the woods for about a week, um, and then it escape and evasion, which was being captured, if you will, and then uh, interrogated, and then uh, trying to figure out how to escape. Uh, but it, it was generic. It was, I think, back then it was uh, it was more of a, a Vietnam slash Soviet kind of slant to it, uh, and it was. Uh, it gave you it gave you some things to think about. I mean, they never laid a hand on me, uh, which I've heard earlier that you know and I've, I heard Navy brethren who have said that when they went through theirs, I mean, they could get slapped around a lot. Uh, but it was a lot of stress positions. It was a lot of mental they're trying to get in, into your head and and stuff like that. Uh, and it was just fatigue. You know, they they kept you awake for you know forty eight hours. Um, so it was it was less physical as much as it was mental as much as it was physical. If you were brought down, did you have like a beacon that you had with you or anything like that? Uh, we did the assumption you were on your own. No, <laughs> we had a survival radio, uh, which was uh, I think it was a PRC ninety at that time. So it had a beacon mode and it had a voice mode. And so when you went down, if you went down in, in wartime. Uh, I can't, they may have turned the beacon mode off in peacetime, that beacon mode would activate immediately. Uh, and then once you got on the ground, you turn it from beacon to voice, uh, and, and talk to whoever was airborne trying to find you. 
Uh, in wartime, I don't think the beacon was immediately on. Uh, so you'd get down, hide your chute, go in the woods, uh, and then you'd try to see if there's any kind of rescue, uh, either friendly cap over you or rescue assets. Uh, and then you could use the beacon sequent, you know, every once in a while to try to give them homing, uh, or you could use the voice mode. But, uh, yeah, it, it had both modes, uh, it was a pretty good radio. They've got something way better than that now, I'm sure, but it was it was not bad. So as far as your electronic countermeasures, it was the chaff and flares, really, to try and uh, put off any missiles? Yeah, we carried uh, ECM pods. Uh, we carried, when I first got there, it was a, I think it was called the ALQ-119. Uh, we, we upgraded to the ALQ-131. Um and they would give you some protection uh, against ground threats. You know, you could, you had a couple of different programming modes, uh, and it would jam certain things. Uh, we really didn't depend on it because the footprint was such that uh, there were lobes where it just wasn't going to work. You know, if you turned outside of the, outside of say ten and two o'clock, uh, you might not be getting any coverage, like say on the beam or something like that. But it was supposed to give you uh, some jamming protection, and uh, we only hope that it did. Obviously, as you got lower, the uh, the coverage was less, you know, because you're in closer proximity to the ground and stuff, especially for ground threats. But, uh, yeah, we did have some. I'm trying to remember if there was an air-to-air program, and I, I don't know if there was. I know there were a couple of air-to-ground air programs for different – levels of threat and stuff but uh, you know mostly it was this massive almost thousand pounds of weight you're carrying out on one wingtip uh so it you know it it it, it changed your uh it changed your performance just a little bit and if you lost the engine on the wrong side then it was really going to change your performance but uh we were glad to have it you know just in case were you on like quick reaction alert like uh some of the other squadrons you mean once it kicked think you kicked off or or before yeah yeah because you you you're the scenario you're expecting is a build up of tension and therefore you then know something's going to happen uh generally we would have had some jets forward at the FOL and if it looked like you know that situation was increasing in in volatility well, if you go back to, and I watched your, or listened to your Able Archer uh, thing in 83, right? Uh, where, you know, it starts ratcheting up. And if the U.S. had decided to ratchet to that next level, uh, you probably would have now seen squadrons of A-10s. Instead of having six at the debt, you'd have 18, and you would have filled the debts, you know, if it got to that next level. Um, so they would, have, they would have had certain triggers where you, where you upped your number of airplanes uh, forward. We never really sat alert, per se, because we're going to be working on uh, on specific tasking from the Army. Uh, we would sit combat SAR alert, uh, you know, for picking up downed airmen. Uh, but as far as sitting, you know, just cast alert, it may have come to that, which wouldn't have been difficult to do because... You could add four airplanes sitting cast alert, and they go, okay, breakthrough in this sector, go. Uh, but what we weren't going to do is probably hold airborne waiting for a target uh, because then we're, we're just wasting time. But uh, we, could get, we could launch a lot of airplanes pretty quickly, and all they would know when they went out the door is, okay, here's your contact point, here's your, here's your fax call sign, uh, get there by this time, and and then you would get the rest of it when you got there. Uh, and that was true of, of most of that dry tasking, uh, which kind of gave us uh, the same training that we would have gotten real time uh, if it had actually happened. Because uh, there were many times where you just show up and you all you knew was the contact point, the frequency, and the guy's call sign, and then he would fill you in from there. Uh, so we, we kind of had that going, but I don't think we really called it that. What was the, the hairiest situation that you had during your 
flying career where did you have any situations where you thought this is not going to end well <laughs> you know i was very fortunate uh, there were a couple of times later on uh in the harrier uh flying night low levels where i surprised myself uh but never got to the point it was really an after the fact realization that well that could have gone really badly <laughs> <laughs> but nothing really at the time, you know, where you get too close to the rocks um, and uh, you don't give yourself time to pull out. It was always an after the fact. You know, it was like, well, that was kind of stupid. Why'd you do that? And uh, don't do that again. But uh, uh, never something that uh, where I really had time to think about it in the moment. It was pretty, uh, I was very fortunate. I don't think I ever lost an engine. Um few bird strikes you know that were never catastrophic uh, thankfully the a10 had a very thick front windscreen that would uh, counteract most bird strikes but uh, no sorry <laughs> oh that's fine no that's good to hear that's good to hear um now you briefly mentioned there the Harrier, and I did want to just come come on to that because you you were part of a U.S. Air Force RAF exchange. What was it like flying the the Harrier compared to the to the A10? Obviously, it's got a vertical takeoff capability, but um, how how was that? <laughs> it was uh, it was very interesting. Um, I got the job. Because my ops officer, when I was a, an instructor at fighter weapons school, had just come from that. And he just raved about it. And, of course, I had just stolen my English wife uh, in, in 1988 and sent her back, brought her back to the States with me. And uh, so it seemed like a good fit for me. I wanted to go back to Europe. Um, this would have kept her, her fairly close to her, her parents. And uh, it was something I always wanted to do. I, I was fascinated by the airplane. But the, air, the, the Harrier itself is uh, the original. Well, the one I flew first was the GR3 and the T4, which is the, the 1960s version, which is just the cockpit is not big. And I'm, so I'm almost 6'2". Uh, and squeegeeing into that thing, it was just like I was, I was inside of a, you know, a really tight space the whole time. Um, it took a lot of getting used to. Uh, their terminology was different. Uh, the airplane obviously uh, did some things that I had never seen before. And so getting used to it, the, there was a little not little knob inboard of the uh, throttle that was the nozzle lever. And uh, at a certain point, it's like patting your head and rubbing your stomach, trying to get throttle set the nozzle lever set the throttle set again you know you got the stick in one hand and you're doing these other two things with one hand and so they used to laugh at me you know <laughs> about my about my hovering capability but uh i was never dangerous which was very important and uh so it uh it, i really enjoyed it but you know you're asking me how many airplanes we lost in a10s at bentwaters uh, and I couldn't think, I could think of one, well, we lost, gosh, four or five in the Harrier Force in the three years I was there, uh, wow. four from, uh, RAF Wittering, uh, in the time I was there, uh, let's see, only one was a fatality, so people got out of the other ones for engine failures and bird strikes, but, uh, it was a little more, you know, thought provoking as far as you, you really you really watched yourself closely uh, especially in the in the circuit when you were doing v-stall work uh, for somebody who wasn't brought up on it and uh, so it kept your mind pretty focused but uh, you know the the RAF that I, I gotta say I mean a great organization I, I mean I was very impressed by uh, everything up and down the chain uh, they don't spend hardly any money on their facilities. I mean, this is the nineties, right? But they are bare bones. Uh, that sounds like the British. Definitely. Yeah. You know, you had, uh, a few tea bags in the, uh, canteen and, uh, maybe a biscuit or two. And that was about it. And, 
you know, the, the building we were in was a uh, World War I uh, building. And it was uh, chock full of history, and and uh, but not really chock full of very many, uh, you know, modern amenities. But the people, uh, the pilots, my goodness, uh, I can't say enough good about the pilots. They were they were excellent, and the Harrier kind of I think at that time was the was the airplane that the the top pilots gravitated to, uh, and so there were no weaklings, you know. I never came across one, one British pilot that didn't make the grade. I mean, they were uh, part of it's the way the RAF trains, which is completely different to the uh, USAF. Uh, but part of it is the aptitude of the of the kids too, and they needed it because it was it was a challenge right from the from the first sortie on. I'm trying to think of other aircraft, other British aircraft that the US have taken on or have manufactured under license. And I'm struggling to think of many. Yeah. That's the only tactical aircraft I can think of. Um, it, be, it became a joint venture later when they went to other uh, other marks of the airplane, the GR-5, GR-7, GR-9. But, um, yeah, that may have been purely Hawker Siddeley to start with. Yeah, I think the only other aircraft I can think of is the Canberra which I think NASA still fly a version of it for high altitude sampling on or what have you. But I think that's the only other one I can think of. You know, funny thing about the Harrier, you go through all the training, you know, you're at the end of the training cycle before you go to your operational squadron. And they were go, right, chaps, uh, let's go down here in the basement and we're going to show you a, a film. It's like, oh, okay. And uh, we go down there, and the film is, gosh, it's probably 25 minutes long. And it is every Harrier crash that's ever occurred in the Marine Corps and the RAF and the Navy. It's every one of them that they had film on. So you just watch these airplanes dropping out of the sky one after the other. And and many of them were VSTAL uh, issues or engine issues within the VSTAL. And so... At the end of it, you know, it was like, right. And their point was very well taken. It's like, all right, you think you know everything and you don't know anything. So, um, you know, watch yourself. Uh, and I told my follow-on um, exchange officers, I said, look, you've kind of got to be your own safety officer here because if you don't feel comfortable with it, uh, you've got you've to say something because uh, for the RAF, it may be normal ops. You know, uh, they operated in lower weather than the USAF did. Uh, they tended, uh, they would call it being punchy. You know, they would push it up, whereas we might have root aborted. They'd just keep on going. You know, it's like, it's better on the other side, boys. Let's go. Uh, so they, yeah, they're, uh, and they were completely enamored of low level. You know, they were still, this is a post-desert storm. They're still down there wazzing around at 250 feet, which they did uh, once they got the night attack version as well. I mean, our training curricula, you ended up at 250 feet above the ground at night without terrain following radar, hand flying this airplane at 450 knots, uh, looking through a a forward fixed FLIR, uh, forward looking IR, and a set of night vision goggles. And, uh, it's like that's pretty interesting and uh, you know they did two seasons of that and never lost a, a bird or a person don't miss the episode extras such as videos photos and other content just look for the link in the podcast information the podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping the podcast on the road The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week.